Hey, good morning. Good morning. This is Pastor Allen with Providence United Methodist Church. Uh, this is our confirmation class. This should be week five. Week five. We're moving right along. Um, we have several people who are out that are sick. And as a matter of fact, I'm a little uh, a little under the weather myself, but uh, I'm going to keep my distance and uh, we're just going to do a little bit of review today. So for those of you who aren't, aren't able to make it today, mostly today is going to be review. We're going to practice our scripture. We're going to go over some of the stuff about baptism from last week. There will be a couple of new videos and I'll put those in the link so you can watch those uh, as we talk about the Methodist movement and the founder uh, of United Methodism. So uh, be sure you watch those videos and you'll be caught up. But again, mostly today is going to be review. All right. All right. So Jaylee's going to give us our opening Wait, prayer. Uh, just thank God for today and ask his blessing to be with us in our lesson time. Okay. Dear God, thank you for having us here at um, confirmation class today and give us a great day. Amen. Amen. Fantastic. That's it. That's, it's really that simple. You just open your heart up and pray what God has on your heart. Okay. All right. So we're going to practice our scriptures a couple of times since it's just a few of us. Uh, you'll both get, to, you'll all get a chance to do it twice. So, um, uh, whatever the order is, I know we're missing people, but whoever's name is first after the people that are gone. So who is that? Mm -hmm. right. Yes, please. Jaylee, stand up. For surely I know the plans I have for you. Says the Lord plans for your welfare and not for harm to give your future with hope. Jeremiah 29, 11. Very good. Jeremiah 29, 11. Who's next? All right. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Very good. Psalm 119.11. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Excellent. And Hebrews 4.16. Um, <laughs> Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may find mercy and grace in our time of need. Very good. All right. Let's do it one more time. All right. And we'll do it one more time at the end, and I'll see if you can try it without your paper. But. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give a future with hope. Very good. Jeremiah 29, 11. Yes, indeed. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You sounds like you go, yours. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Psalm 119, 11. I have hidden your heart in my word that I might not sin against you. All right. You switched a couple of words. I've hidden your word in my heart, but you said in my heart and my word, but very good. And Hebrews 4.16, let us then approach the throne of grace uh, with confidence, so that we, I say, I'm missing the last part, uh, so that way we may find grace in our time of need. Very good. Good job, guys. All right. Excellent job, ladies. Okay. Um, so who can remember, this is just a quick little bit of review, uh, and, and they're not looking at their papers, who can remember how many ways, how many modes of baptism we offer? Raise your hands if you remember how many ways, how many modes of baptism. All right, so the two ladies remember, DJ remembers. Do you remember KJ by chance? All right, Jaylee, what's the answer? Is it three? three. We offer three modes or three ways to be baptized in United Methodist Church. All right, so can you name two out of the three? Raise your hand if you want to name one. Name two out of the three. Yes, ma'am. Sprinkling. Sprinkling, very good. That's what happened whenever you were a baby. Immersion. Immersion, that's right. That's going completely under the water. And what's the third one? Can anybody name the third one? Pouring, yes. Sprinkling, pouring, immersion. Sprinkling is just a, a, a few little scoops of water, generally, again, put on the baby. Pouring uh, is more water, essentially. It's a beautiful ceremony, though, where you have a chance to have, uh, have the pitchers of water poured over you. And then immersion is where you'll be completely dunked under the water. Okay? Um, we offer that, but we don't feel as though it's absolutely necessary. Some other denominations say that that's the way you have to do it, but we don't believe that. We believe that baptism, uh, that God is the one who operates in baptism, and it's not the amount of water, but it's the work that God is doing. Okay. So baptism is a sacrament. How many sacraments do we have in the United Methodist Church? Two. Of them. Two. Yeah, two sacraments. Baptism is one. What's the other one? Communion. Communion, yeah. Yep, communion. Very good. All right, let's see what else. Uh, what is baptism? All right. Um, 
not sure, but I think it's like giving hope to God or something. Okay, that's a good that's a good way to say it. All right. How else have we described baptism? Somebody to ask you, what are you doing when you were being baptized? What's happening? Okay. I'll share the phrase with you again. There's a phrase that we use. What we say it is an, in fact, I want you to repeat after me. It's an outward sign, an outward of, an sign. of an inward grace. Right. It's an outward sign, an outward sign. of an inward grace. All right, so all that means is that when we are baptized, we are taking on an action. We are, we are following through with, with this outward sign. We don't use the word symbol, but it's this outward sign of what's taking place already inside of us. God is the one who is initiating the baptism. God is the one who is moving in the waters of baptism. And so what we are doing is we have become a visible witness, a public witness as an outward sign of an inward grace. Okay. Um, do we, can we get baptized by ourselves? No. no. Why not? It's public. Yeah, that's right. It's a public proclamation. That's exactly right. We are declaring our faith whenever we are baptized. Can we in the United Methodist Church be rebaptized? We can be rebaptized? No. Oh. No. We can have an affirmation, a reaffirmation of our baptism. Okay. That, that, that means that we can, we can remember our baptism and there are, there are, uh, uh, forms of the worship that we do to help us do that. Okay. So you can go back into the water again and we can go through a form of the worship that will help us to remember our baptism. But officially, specifically, we are not rebaptized. Okay. In the United Methodist Church, we believe that God did it right the first time. So we are not rebaptized. All right. Y'all did good. Uh, I'll, I'll, how about another? Should be easy one by this point. Who baptized Jesus? John. Yes. 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 John the Baptist baptized Jesus. All right. That was a give me. You all should know that one by now. Okay. So I'm going to pause it here. Uh, I'm going to put on a couple of the videos for you all to watch. Uh, there's no notes that you have to take this time. Well, I do want you to pay attention, though, because I'm going to ask some questions about it. But there's no notes or anything that you have to fill in on the sheet of paper. OK, so for those of you watching at home, there's no there's no assignment to turn in. But I do want you to be just familiar with the concepts. A couple of the videos are going to be some other confirmation classes from years past, not from our church, but just others that have posted stuff online. And so you'll see some of the other confirmation classes. And then also there'll be a lesson in one of the videos. OK. So I'll stop this one here and link the others. I want you as you are, not as you ought to be. Won't you lay down your guard and come to me? The shame that grips you now is crippling. It breaks my heart to see you suffering. Kick
Have you ever wondered how our church started? Not necessarily this church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but that's a really good story too. But the United Methodist Church. It all started with this guy named John Wesley. You see, a long time ago after Peter and Paul roamed the earth, you know, those guys we talked about last week, an Anglican priest in England named John Wesley would go on to form one of these different groups known as the Methodists. Now, Wesley was a little different for his time when it came to following Jesus. He was very methodical in how he prayed and read the Bible. He thought an awful lot about God's grace and the role that it plays in our lives. Now, Wesley never meant to start a new denomination, but his followers first met in private home societies. When these societies became too large for members to care for one another, Wesley would organize classes, each with 11 members and a leader. Does that sound familiar? It's because it's kind of how Jesus did things. But anyways, classes met weekly to pray, read the Bible, discuss their spiritual lives, and to collect money for charity. Men and women met separately, but anyone could become a class leader. These meetings would get bigger and bigger. And by the time Wesley died, he had built a movement with 294 preachers, 71,000 British members, 19 missionaries, 43,000 American members with 198 American preachers. And today, Methodists are numbering 30 million worldwide. Throughout his ministry, John Wesley loved to talk about grace. No, not you, Grace. The other Grace, the Word. Grace can be hard to define because it's something God gives us, it's something we give to others, and sometimes we even give it to ourselves. It's because it's a gift. It's also God's presence in our lives, which heals, forgives, reconciles, and transforms us. Wherever God is, grace is too. It's free, it's undeserved, it's grace. Now John Wesley believed there were three types of grace, prevenient, justifying, and sanctifying. To sum those up, prevenient grace is the grace that is present before we know Jesus. God was still chasing after you before you even knew you needed him. Justifying grace is the grace, that moment when you come to know God and commit your life to following him and his will. Finally, sanctifying grace is the grace that is present throughout the rest of your life as you strive to obtain your complete identity in Christ and be more like Him. John Wesley would experience all of these types of grace in his life in many different ways. In a burning house as a kid, on a boat to Savannah, Georgia with the Moravians, he would watch them worship God in the midst of a terrible storm. And in Savannah with his ex-girlfriend when he refused to serve her and her new boyfriend communion, he wondered how God would ever forgive him. Back in England on Aldersgate Street during a Bible study, he felt his heart being strangely warmed. All of these moments were huge in Wesley's life. He would look back and call them all as moments where God and the Holy Spirit and grace were present in his life. Where God is, grace is too. So, what does grace look like in your life? Can you identify the three types of grace where God has been present in different times of your life? If not, that's okay. Now that you know about all of these types of grace, you'll be able to see them in your own mind. Now, head on over to your student guide and complete the activities that go with this lesson. We'll see you next time. Okay, so now you've had a chance to watch a couple of those videos. Uh, we watched a, a couple of the confirmation classes and then a video about uh, the founder of the Methodist movement and some of his beliefs. So first question I'm going to ask you, if you remember, if you heard on the video, who is the founder of the Methodist movement or United Methodism? Did you hear? John Wesley. John Wesley. Very good. Yeah. It's going to give you a clue. Same, same first name as the person who baptized Jesus. But John Wesley is the founder of the Methodist movement. John Wesley was an Anglican priest. He was a priest in the Church of England. John Wesley was a uh, was a very devout follower of Jesus, and he uh, he often wanted to make time for prayer and for study. And he got a couple of his friends at school. He was at Oxford 
University. And he got a few of his friends at school to also join him in a very ritual, very pattern, very methodical way of studying and praying. And so just like kids do, you know how you all tease each other. Sometimes you come up with nicknames and make fun of each other. Well, some of the other kids, some of the other students on campus thought that their behavior was kind of weird. Here were these guys who were going off to pray. Here were these guys that were going off to read the Bible. And they did it at the same time every day. Every day they would go off to do this activity. And it was very methodical. And so the other students began to tease them and call them Methodist. Those, those Methodist folks over there. And John Wesley said, you're right. He liked the idea. He liked what they were calling him. He turned it around. And so instead of it being a slur, instead of it being an attack, instead of it being a way that they were picking on him, he said, you're right. I am a Methodist. I have a, a systematic way in which that I want to follow through on my discipleship. I believe in going to church. I believe in studying the Bible. I believe in prayer. I believe in helping other people. And I want to do these things often. I want to do them regularly. And so he becomes Methodist. Well, that's what he gets called. But he was still a priest in the Anglican Church, and he never really fully intended on leaving the Anglican Church, but he did want to see some reforms happen within the church. He wanted them to change a few things, but he was he was so caught up and so on fire and so wanted to do things for God that he kept drawing more and more people with his preaching. And he would talk to them and teach them how to live and show them the things of Jesus. And the more he did that, the more they also wanted to organize themselves into small groups. They started as holy clubs and then they became holy societies. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Just a quick question, not the super, super uh, 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 um, quiz, but but just a quick question. Does anybody remember how many United Methodists there are now in the world? You remember them hearing them say that on the video? Uh, well, okay. So there were a couple of different figures. You're right. There were a couple of different figures that were given in terms of like the number in, in, in America versus around versus how many around the world, but there's 33 million of us. So you are a part of a very large denomination. We are the second largest Protestant denomination behind the Southern Baptist convention. Okay. So, um, so there are a bunch and bunch and bunch of United Methodists. All right, so that's enough of those questions for now. I'm going to show you uh, one or two more videos, and then and then I want to ask you to ask me some questions. Uh, any thoughts that you have about God? Anything that you want to try to get answered? And depending on how complex it is, I may have to write it down <laughs> and bring an answer to you next week. OK, but we'll get some conversation going. So be thinking about anything that you want to ask about God. You already got a question that you want to ask about God. Well, let, let's hang on because I want you to hear some of the questions that the youth on this next video, some of the things that they think about. And then we'll start our conversation. If I didn't believe in God, I wouldn't be here right now at confirmation. We're going to church. My life would be totally different. Every Sunday I wouldn't be playing string bass. And I if I didn't believe in God, this would be different. My life would not be what it is, and I never would have done anything in God's name. If I didn't have God in my life, I probably wouldn't be able to find joy in my life. I think I'd be kind of lost because he like fills us with joy and he helps us find the little things in life that matter. It just makes us really happy. If well, I didn't believe in God, I probably wouldn't find like the positive things in life. God always helps me to like find my way. Like whenever I don't know what to do in a certain situation, I always ask God and he usually has the answer. If I didn't believe in God, then I probably wouldn't forgive as easy as I do. And a lot of things in my life would be a lot different. And I wouldn't have made the changes that I've made in my life. Uh, I've always been told that God is always listening to you, listening to your prayers. But sometimes I just don't think he's listening or paying attention to me. He doesn't, like, talk back to me in my head. Um, what I don't understand is that God just kind of lets me choose some people that I know that I shouldn't choose in my life. And I just go, why that person? Why did you put that person in my life? You know that person was a bad influence in the beginning. Why didn't you let me just kind of start hanging out with them? 
Sure. Okay, so why I don't ha why I have doubts in God sometimes is because why does He take away like one of my loved ones and stuff? Um, so I just don't understand that. I mean, I'm, I get that they're meant to go to heaven and they're in a better place, but it's just hard knowing that they're not here. I doubt God when He, he lets bad things happen because God, when you believe in God, you're supposed to find the good in the situations, but sometimes I just can't. <clears throat> so like. What I don't understand is that when God does terrible things to people that haven't done anything like bad, like are good people, and that go to church every Sunday, but yet they lose loved ones, and there's some people out there that don't go to church and they're fine. They don't so I don't got to win. Um, sometimes I just don't like know how he created everything. And sometimes it's a little bit hard to grasp, but I do know that he's out there, and I do believe in him. And so sometimes it's just hard to grasp that, but I think that's what it's all about. Well, I really hated going to church, Sunday school. I, I hated it. I hated getting up early in the morning at like 6 o'clock to get ready. But now, I love going to church. 9.15, rocking on the bass. It's really fun. And I learned a lot about God there, too. Okay, my perspective of God has changed completely from, like, when I was little. And, like, you know, your parents are like, go to church, go to church. And it's like, check yes if you, like, love God. And you're just like, okay, you know, I'm obligated to check yes. But as I've learned, you know, I really have gotten to know God and stuff, it seems like, through mission trips and retreat and all the friends. And I just can't imagine my life without it. What I figured out about God is, and the difference in my life is that just because he's God doesn't mean that he's just going to be there for you always. You're, you're going to have to ask for it and stuff. And that's what I've learned in the past years about him. And that's made a difference in me besides going to camp and meeting all these cool people there and having them share their experiences. And that's just what's made a difference in my life is because I'm always happy to listen to Christian music or just be at church or in retreats and so that's what's made a difference. Um, I would say my relationship with God has changed a lot. I feel a lot more comfortable with him now and I guess I wasn't as much when I was younger and I feel like I can ask for forgiveness and I used to not be able to do that because that was kind of hard and it's really personal but once you get to know God it's really easy and it's full of joy. I feel like I have a whole new outlook on life and I'm thankful for that. Well, when I was younger, I never liked coming to church. But now, like, since I've, like, been connected somewhat to God, I actually like coming to church, and I always, and, like, my relationship with God. Like, now I see, like, the more positive things in life since I've had a relationship with Him. I'd like to thank the congregation for the 915 service, where I have a blast on the bass guitar, playing music every Sunday. It's really fun, and I really love it. I'm thankful for all the friends I've made here in the church. I'm thankful for all the opportunities this church has given me in retreats and mission trip and all the different programs and stuff, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I just want to be thankful for sending me to camp. Or all these years I've gone, I really enjoyed it. It's changed my life entirely. I'd like to thank the congregation for like never looking down upon the youth and always believing in us because if you guys didn't do that, I probably wouldn't volunteer as much here and be involved here as I am now. I want to thank the church for always being a comfortable place to come. It's always welcoming and everyone here kind of feels like family. One thing you should know about God is how would you be here if it wasn't for God? Just think about that. God will always love you. God will always forgive you. God will always be there for you, even in the worst times. God understands you. One thing that you should always understand about God is that no matter where you've come from, your past, what you do, that he'll still love you and that he'll forgive you. God and faith prevails. For it is through Jesus Christ our Savior we are saved. Throughout my past recent years, I have learned to discover God in the easy times and lean on Him in the hard times. Then I started praying. I realized I could confess everything in a prayer and I would be forgiven. God turned from a distant figure in the clouds to someone I could confide in. I also know that if Jesus had not died for us, that we would not be able to be saved for none of us uplifted. My faith has 
had a major impact on my life because it has helped me learn more about God and myself. And I'm proud to say that I am a Christian. I love my faith and I love the people I'm surrounded by because of my faith. Confirmation is a, I mean for me, a public profession of faith. So it's kind of like getting baptized. I experience God in my everyday life, so as a Christian, I plan to walk in the footsteps of Him and spread His word to others. Even though I've been through these things, God has always been with me and gotten me through it. With God, this entity who I love and loves me, I can do anything. My faith has been tested, I feel, these past few months, but I hope that I remain strong in my faith. Jesus told God in the Garden of Gethsemane, let your will be done. I want God's will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. All right, so we're going to take a few minutes now and um, discuss questions that we have about God. So my first question actually, though, is, what questions did they ask that caught your attention, if anything? Was anything were any of the questions that the other that the other students asked anything that you was like, oh, that's that's an interesting question. Not for you, KJ. None of, none of their questions made any sense to you or made any difference. Okay. For you, ladies. Nothing in particular. All right, that's fine. Okay, so what questions do you have about God? You had one earlier. Well, let me, uh, KJ had some, some, let KJ go first. You don't want to go first? <laughs> okay, what, what what was it, DJ? What were you asking? I thought they were reaffirming their grace. Now. I was just thinking about that stuff. Okay, reaffirming grace. I feel like it's statement they're supposed to make. There, there are creeds that they can that we that they were sharing, yes, as they were also identifying their faith. I don't have any questions about God. You forgot your question. <laughs> mm. Okay. All right. Well, that's okay. If you, if you don't have any questions, that's fine. I won't, I won't force you to try to come up with a question about God. But if you think about something and there's a, there's a question that you have, we can talk about that after a while. All right. So let's practice our scripture one more time then. Uh, and then we'll, we'll close out for today. So we'll, we'll go in reverse order this time. So DJ, if you'll stand first. Hebrews 4.16. May we approach the throne of God uh, in our time of need, so that way we can retrieve grace. All right, I think I'm going to flip it around. I think it, yeah, hold on. Hebrews 4.16. May we then approach the throne of God with confidence, so that way we can retrieve grace in our time of need. Okay. Yeah. All right. Psalm 119, 11. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Okay. Psalm 119, 105. Very good. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give future reproach. Jeremiah 29, 11. All right. Very good. When the United Methodists were, uh, were forming like that, did they do. I've heard that they were like talking about confirmation class where they were trying to form groups like that. Uh, so I don't know exactly when confirmation classes themselves first started, but what, what you may have heard them talk about were, uh, were uh, the holy clubs. Uh, those were the smaller groups. And then they formed into larger groups that they called societies. Mm -hmm. And then on an annual basis, they would get together for what's called a conference. So that's whenever several of them would come in from a larger area and come together for conference, which is something we still do today. Once a year, once a year at the at the local church level at the and at the um, and at the annual conference level, we have this uh, meeting. Uh, it's usually in June. Yeah, it's usually around Father's Day in June for for this for this area. Yeah, well, what are you about? but now and then the and then the and then the, the 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 whole denomination gets together once every four years. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you asked what we talk about. Yeah, 
um, the structure of the church, the ministries of the church, um, they, how many people are being ordained, uh, people that are, uh, have served for a long time that are retiring as far as clergy are concerned, um, what wonderful things the laity have done. So there's, there's a, a lot of business that takes place. It's usually like a three day meeting, sometimes four days. Yeah. Okay. Is it like through discussion that you figure out what the future plans for the congregation? Yes. Yes. So there's discussion and then they can make uh, a decision on about next steps and plans and, and how maybe it would be difficult to arrange all that. It definitely takes some work. There's some people that work very hard to make sure all the logistics come together so that the meeting is successful. Any other questions, ladies? Anybody? Why am I a pastor? Yeah. Ooh, what a great question. Ooh, wee. Well, why am I a pastor? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to give you this short, short answer. That's a really good question. Because actually, I was when I went to college, I was in school for architecture originally. And then I switched out of the school of architecture and went into the school of business. Because um, I always liked business. But I actually graduated <laughs> with with my a political science and business degree. So I have I had uh, a business ma I mean a political science major and a business minor. Anyway, point though um so the first answer the the first part of that answer KJ is I believe that I was called. I felt I felt a sense from God that God was asking me to uh be set aside for the work of the ministry. All of us all, all of us are called to serve. By virtue of the fact that we follow Jesus Christ, by virtue of the fact that we are his disciples, he says that we're supposed to love one another, right? So you all do projects with the youth group, right? You, you raise money, uh, you, you go shopping and pick up items. There are things that you do as a, as a part of your discipleship. You do them because you feel as though the Lord has asked you to do it. Well, another part of that, another component of that is stepping into leadership roles. And so your youth leaders felt God tugging on their hearts and saying, why don't you step up and help lead these young people? And that's the same way it was for me for the whole church. I felt God saying, I need you to be set aside. That's the phrase that we use to, to uh, make this um, a part of your active discipleship. And so I am an elder in the United Methodist Church, which means that part of my role is to teach. You know, I, I preach the word. I teach people the Bible. I am part of the ordering and structuring of the church. Right. So uh, we, we can't do things without things being um, planned and organized and put together. And so I'm a part of, of doing that uh, and providing just general leadership and guidance for the church. But another reason, so aside from the calling, KJ, it also, I also feel like it, it is my life's purpose. I really feel as though I got a sense from God that God said, this is how, this is the reason why I made you. I made you for this. Um, and so for me to do otherwise would be to not be honoring the God who made me. But I also get to do a lot of really cool stuff. I get to hang out with youth. I get to be with the senior adults. Uh, I get to go visit people during good times and bad. So I'm with people in the hospitals whenever they're sick and they're not well. But at the same time, I get to go to people's graduations and I get to be a part of their weddings. And so I, I, I am in a very joyful and privileged position that I get to be with people um, in all parts and aspects of their lives. And I think that's important. Is there another role you play with being pastor to do stuff like that? Uh, so there are other there are other roles that that are offered. There are other there are other places that people feel called. It, we have um, we have what we call deacons in the United Methodist Church. You could be called to the order of deacon, for example, um, and those are people that that also focus on some of the things that I said uh, as far as what elders do, but in particular, they also focus on compassion and justice and they help become a bridge. They, they help bridge the church to the community into the world. 
And so they serve a very important role. Um, but you also don't have to necessarily be clergy. You don't have to necessarily take on and do what I'm doing. There are multiple levels, like we said, youth leader, or you can do what Brother Neil Hall does, and he is the he is the lay leader for the church. Uh, there are people like Tim Draper, who is the council chair of the church. And so all of these are places where where people have felt as though God said, I want you to do this in service for the church. Okay. We can talk about that some more later on, but for now, uh, since KJ's got his eyes closed, KJ, won't you give us a closing prayer? Yes. No. The camera's on you. It's going to stay on you, and everybody's going to see that you're resistant. Come on. Just say what's on your heart, son. That's all you got to do. Just give Thank us a you, Lord, for today and this wonderful youth group and time that we have together now. Amen. Amen. Very good.